It is a distinct pleasure and a privilege to be back. As you know, or some of you know, I came to this field as a skeptic, as many of us have. Perhaps I stayed too long. But I have found what I believe I can in the next hour synthesize for you, kind of everything I've learned since kindergarten, more or less. And the essence of it is about prebiotics, probiotics, symbiotics. But behind that is rethinking health as if, first of all, do no harm and putting the patient's welfare first makes sense in an evidence-based, personalized, biochemical individuality-based, healthful caring system. So, I am a fellow as a clinical pathologist. I'm a fellow of the American College of Nutrition, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm a scientific fellow, Federation of Clinical Immunology Societies, Federation of American Laboratory Immunologists. I'm an overseas fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine. I'm either easily bored or I have a Jewish mother or both. <laughs> I am a fellow and a founder of the Health Studies Collegium where integrative evidence-based research is done. Uh, successful outcome studies in type 1 and type 2 diabetes, fibromyalgia, adrenal dysfunction, and so forth suggest that there really is a science that supports this approach as first-line comprehensive care. I am, for full disclosure, founder and chairman of Perk Integrative Health, as well as Elizak Biotechnologies and RMJHRX. These are three companies. Uh, one is a diagnostic lab. Uh, one is a products company uh, that provides evidence-based uh, nutritionals. And one is a drug development company using natural products uh, in therapeutic modes. So that's the disclaimer. That's the disclaimer out of the way. And while it's going to be relatively short, here's what's called the phylogenetic tree. So this is kind of everybody. You've got protozoa and algae. And it turns out that we, animals, are in between fungi and slime molds. Now, I'm not sure who made this up or why, but that's how it came out. And uh, all of these are bacteria. All of these. And many of those may be familiar to you, although most of the ones that are familiar to you will be familiar as pathogens, not as probiotics. And now a slightly different version. Here again you have everything. The animalia are just this little part of the tree. And firmicutes. How many of you can spell firmicute? It turns out they're really important. And they're cute. And they're firm. Which is why they're called firmicutes. And they're gram negatives. Now they're gram positives, but you've got to look for them carefully in here and Chlamydia, oh yeah, we've heard about chlamydia, oh boy. And uh, cyanobacteria and other things, oh, oh my. Okay. You can, if you want, have a very good time being lost in the forest of the probiotics. I don't have time for it. Here's the essence with regard to the probiotics. We now have incontrovertible evidence that probiotics decrease children's allergy risk. Incontrovertible. And you give 40 billion probiotic live organisms a day. You can pick your strain. I prefer multi-strains. Most of the research is done on one strain. That's a strain. But the, thank you. The mammalian, some of the jokes are very subtle. It takes a little while, it's okay. Mammalian gut microbiota. I was taught about that. We're mammals. We have guts. Microbiota. All of a sudden, it's the microbiome. Now you get paid more if you say microbiome and metabolome in the same sentence. But the mammalian gut microbiota are the immune system, half of your immune system. Autoimmune disease intolerance is largely determined by digestion and related phenomenology. Whether you're obese or lean, do you know that some of you are not at your lean weight? And a lot of you are. Mazel tov and congratulations. I was talking to a friend yesterday and he noticed that there was less of me than there had been and I asked him, did I lose the better part? I don't know. I'll let you decide. Inflammatory bowel disease and neurodegenerative syndromes. 
and we've already been educated about how in the environment we today, people did this to each other, by the way, we today created the opportunity for a level of intergenerational and persisting toxicity and suffering and cost and extra morbidity and mortality, which I will talk about, at a level that has never been seen on the planet before. This is the first time, to the best of my knowledge, that inadvertently a woman while pregnant or a couple before they get pregnant can get exposed to a certain chemical, a persisting pollutant, a volatile chemical, a toxic metal, a radioisotope, and two or three generations later, two or three generations later, they're feeling the effects. And guess what? Did you notice that we're in the third generation of this experiment? I hope you signed your form informed consent. Now, this is a scanning electron micrograph, and it has been colorized and pretty eyes, but each one of those colors is a different kind of bug. And if we had more colors, you would see more bugs. Because there's a lot of them. And most of them we can't even culture. But today, if you want to spend enough money, you can do the genetic fingerprint, and I will talk about that. But now I really want to make a quick transition. If you only want to hear about probiotics, here is all I have to say. 40 billion and 40 grams. 40 billion probiotic organisms a day in fermented foods and supplements. 40 grams or more of prebiotic fiber. If you chew your food a lot, if you must chew your food, Dennis Burkett suggests you're getting enough fiber. If you're not doing a lot of mastication, you're not getting enough fiber. 40 grams of prebiotic fiber, 40 billion probiotic organisms from diet and supplements. Now, the average American gets less than 7 grams of fiber and a few billion probiotic organisms, not enough because the acidophilus, how many of you have heard of acidophilus? I hope that everyone in the room is, who's awake is going to raise their hand. Right? This is just a test. Anyone still sleeping? Okay. So acidophilus we've heard of. But it's a feeder organism. It nurtures. It's a maternal organism. It nurtures others, but it doesn't multiply in the gut. So every day you have to take it in. Oh, okay. Every traditional diet around the planet has fermented foods. Not the same fermented foods, but every traditional diet, every healthy diet, and we've gone around the planet and around history, actually, looking for healthy patterns, and there are some, and I'm going to talk to you about them. And one of them is 40-40, 40, 40, 40 grams of fiber, unprocessed, and 40 billion or more probiotic organisms a day. Now I'm going to make the transition, and I'm going to argue that if you want those prebiotics and probiotics to work, it has to be placed in a larger context. And that the next big thing is prebiotics, probiotics, and symbiotics, and predictive biomarkers. How many of you are in favor of biochemical individuality? I, I hope all of you. You don't have to raise your hand just because I'm raising my hand, but, right? We're in favor of biochemical individuality. This means that the epigenetics has to be modulated so that the nutrient intake varies to the person. Oh, thank you, Roger Williams. He said that in the 50s, and he was right, but it was really hard. And I'm going to make it easy, because I believe that the next big thing are these predictive biomarkers interpreted to goal values. And that when you get the predictive biomarkers in line, you will be taking healthy whole foods that you can digest, assimilate, and eliminate without immune burden. And I'm even going to tell you how to measure that with just eight tests. In fact, if you said to me, and this is just a hypothetical, but if you said to me, are these eight tests enough? If you really understand how to use them, interpret them, and apply them in a lifestyle way, you really need very little more than the eight tests I'm going to tell you about today, some of which you've heard about, some of which you've heard about, but I'm going to give you some nuances of interpretation and some nuances of application that I think you may not have heard about. Now, is there any evidence? Yes, there's lots of evidence. Here are some of the core articles that I would recommend to you, but I especially recommend to you, if you have a computer, 
that you go and watch Dr. Joel Doré. I met him in Sao Paulo last May when I was giving some lectures, and he has a YouTube video where he explains in a way that any layperson can understand how essential probiotics, prebiotics, and symbiotics are. Now, he does research outside of Paris. He has a very big budget. If, you were, if he was doing research on you, he could take an aspirate from your small intestine or from your poop and find out the thousand most common species of organisms in your digestive tract. And I will tell you later about how quickly, if you make a change in what you consume, your microbiome, your digestive tract changes based on his and some other colleagues' data. I also highly recommend to you Dan Waitsberg's In Gut We Trust. In Gut We Trust. Dan has an annual meeting in Sao Paulo. 3,000 intensivist physicians learn about the use of prebiotics, probiotics, and symbiotics from whoever he feels can talk about them in a way that's evidence-based. The book is called In Gut We Trust. It is written for intelligent lay people. It is not a highly technical book. It is something that they give out in order to convince the patients that the other doctors aren't speaking truthfully when the doctors say fui. Now, I don't know how to say fui in Portuguese, but it's also in Portuguese. Okay. Now, ah, thank you. Thank you. Predictive biomarkers have met a high standard. They have to meet a high standard. They have to be predictive. Predictive. They have to be predictive of all cause morbidity and mortality. Because I'm going to suggest you can use these tests to determine if the therapies are appropriate for the individual, and the first therapies are always natural and lifestyle. Eat, drink, think, do therapies first, and then if you need to, you add on to that. So we can, if we have proper predictive biomarkers, if they pass this high standard, we can use them in practice and we can use them in case anybody, like a medical board or someone who is interested in knowing whether there really was evidence to support our approach because the minority, and last time I checked, we were in the minority. Now, we'll soon be in the majority, but at the moment, we're in the minority. The minority does need to have evidence to support its point of view, otherwise the majority will say poo-poo somehow. So in order for a predictive biomarker to work, it has to have been used for long periods of time in all ethnic groups, in all geographic areas, in all socioeconomic conditions, so that it's predictive significance. It's meaningful. It's sensitive and specific, which means it's predictive significance is powerful. And indeed, I'm going to suggest that these predictive biomarkers will allow you to become epigeneticists instantly, that metabolomics and microbiomics will not just be things that you can say in you know, cocktail parties and, and to impress friends, but that you will use these in practice. And yes, much of it is familiar, but it does turn out that certain words are in vogue. And microbiome and metabolome test very well to consumers. People actually do this for a living. A friend of mine, she tells me very specifically, she tells me that the word wellness is in and holistic is out. But next week it might be holistic is in and wellness is out, so stay tuned for further bulletins. But we want predictive biomarkers, and we want them to tell us, inform us, guide us about epigenetics, metabolomics, and microbiomics. So, since I've teed this up, what are these tests? And I'm going to introduce four <clears throat> that I believe are the standards against which everything else is measured. And then I'm going to introduce four that I think will pass the test, but are the ones on the way up. So personalized evidence-based medicine depends upon qualified predictive biomarkers. And the first one, and this is one I'm sure you've heard of, hemoglobin A1c. How many of you have heard of this? Again, a test of the people being awake in the room. Everyone's heard of this test. In 1967, Dr. Paul Gallup who was really a collagen biochemist, noticed that it was possible, because there was sugar stuck onto collagen and elastin, that maybe other proteins had sugar stuck on them, and maybe that amount of sugar was related to the efficiency of insulin sugar 
uh, conversion to ATP. So the hemoglobin A1C test is a measure of AGEs, age-associated glycolipid end products, bad things that accumulate in the body, and it really gives you a global measure of sugar, insulin, and cell energy set point. However, I'm going to suggest in a few minutes that we interpret this against goal values. I'm going to tell you what they are and why the difference is dramatic in terms of your probability, the chance of living 10 years. Second test. Again, you've heard of this, HSCRP, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. It's a measure of inflammation. It's really a measure of repair deficit. It's not cardio-specific, it systemically measures repair ability or deficit and inflammation status. It is really a molecular call for reserves in the body. So HSCRP goes up when the body is not able to repair some wound or damage or wear and tear that needs to be done. And this is a molecule that says, come here, cells that can do more repair, dendritic cells, fibroblasts, and so forth. So you're assessing chronic, degenerative, autoimmune, and cardiovascular diseases in regard to how well the person is repairing or how much inflammation they have. The third one is homocysteine. Again, one I'm sure you've heard of, but I'm going to suggest the interpretation has an important nuance. And this gives you information about methylation and detoxification, but also about protein transport and about sulfur cycles, which turn out to be very important in detoxification, at least one phase of it. So homocysteine is a predictive biomarker, better known in relation to cardiovascular disease because of Kilmer McCulley and others, but really a global all-cause morbidity mortality marker, and I'm going to present the evidence for that in just a few minutes after I present first the test. The fourth is your immune tolerance test. This is the lymphocyte response by ELISA Act. It measures whether you are immune tolerant or reactive in the delayed pathways. So it picks up the meaningful antibodies, but not the beneficial antibodies and the T cell responses. So you get all three delayed pathways in one overview test. I'm also suggesting that there are four more. I'm going to headline them first and then talk about them in detail. And the first is first morning urine pH. This tells you about net excess metabolic acid. It costs penny a day. The patients do this at home. It also gives you an index of buffering minerals. Do you have enough of the good minerals like magnesium and potassium, or are you deficient at the cellular level so that the net metabolic acids produced exceed the minerals coming in, and you try to get rid of that acid in the morning? Otherwise, you would burn out the kidneys and die. So there's a good reason why metabolic acidosis uh, is uh, guarded against in the body. And first morning urine pH, after six hours of rest, the urine equilibrates with the bladder cells. And so then and only then, only after six hours of rest, the next urine that comes out is a measure of mineral status. And it's the best five cents a day test of mineral status that I know. And I, I do this at home. My kids do, do, do this. My dad did this when he was alive. And I recommend this as an emerging predictive biomarker. I also recommend vitamin D. If you went down the street, even here in Vancouver, giving out vitamin D, you would reduce the cost of health care in the province. You would reduce the amount of pain. You would lower the blood pressure. You would build bones. The country is deficient in vitamin D. When I talk about these uh, in the next series, I'm going to talk about the goal values and how to know how much to give and when to stop, because enough is enough, but too much is too much, and too little is too little. You can write that down. Too little is too little, too much is too much. In the middle is where we want to be, the path of moderation. But in a rainstorm, the path of moderation is different than in the springtime. Or in the winter, the path of moderation is di different than in the summer. You can figure that one out, too then I recommend a finger stick test for omega-3 to 6 ratio. I think we will learn that too much omega-6 is too much and too little omega-3 is too little, and that on average we should be taking more omega-3 and less omega-6. 
This is the essential fatty acid family. And the last is whether your DNA is under extra oxidative stress. And that is 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine, or 8-hydroxy-G. It's a measure of DNA oxidative stress, of free radicals in the nucleus, and it's a urine test. And just like hemoglobin A1c measures AGEs, this one measures ALEs, advanced lipid oxidation end products. You've heard from other presenters how really important inflammation and oxidative stress is in the body and how toxic metals are intimately related to that, but so are other toxicants, so are other persisting pollutants and hormone disruptors and sometimes volatile organic chemicals, which might open the blood-brain barrier under certain circumstances when it should be closed. Now, I'd like to take you through each of these predicted biomarkers and relate this at the end back to the prebiotic probiotic premise. Hemoglobin A1c is the first we're going to look at. Is there evidence that you can measure survival, 10 years survival, based on the hemoglobin A1c level? And is the measure meaningful for every geological, geographical, ethnographic, economic, category. Yes. Not my data, other data, but this shows that if you have a hemoglobin A1c of less than 5%, your 10-year survival, 10-year survival is better than 99%. Whether you're 20, 40, 60, or 80, your 10-year survival, if you have a hemoglobin A1c of less than 5, is more than 99%. I like that. I want to keep my hemoglobin A1c less than 5. I want you to also. But if you have a hemoglobin A1c that's over 7, and I know a lot of people that are higher than that, if your hemoglobin A1c is over 7, you have a 20% chance of living 10 years. How many of you know patients, or maybe even know someone in your own family, who has a hemoglobin A1c of 6 or 7? Okay. They're giving up decades of recoverable life and the hemoglobin A1c changes decades before you die, which is why it's a measure of predictive nature years to decades ahead. The American Diabetes Association says no longer measure blood sugar and insulin, measure hemoglobin A1c. And if you're a really smart doctor, and I'm sure you are, you may know a patient whose hemoglobin A1c was low, but their blood sugar was elevated, and I'll tell you that that was white coat hyperglycemia, and the same people have white coat hypertension. Coming into a doctor's office raises cortisol and epinephrine in some people. Now, not in your patients, but in some patients, including me, when I went to see Harry Black to have my blood pressure checked. So white coat hypertension, white coat hyperglycemia can be avoided by just don't even measure the blood sugar. Now, if you're a type 1 diabetic and you're on insulin, don't listen to this part of the conversation. I do want you to be measuring your blood sugar, and I want you to be taking insulin if you need it, human insulin based on the levels. But for those of us who are not type 1 diabetics, those of us who are on our way to being type 2 diabetics, and I don't know if you noticed, but Uwe Reinhardt, the famous uh, health economist, has pointed out that in just a generation and a half, at the rate we're going, everyone is going to be in a hospital bed taking care of the person next to them because there isn't going to be any tax revenue because everybody's going to be in a hospital bed. So we want our hemoglobin A1C less than 5. We don't want it more than 7. And I know people whose hemoglobin A1C is higher than 7, which means, honestly, they should get their affairs in order or they should make a change in their lifestyle. Lifestyle. Now, to reinforce the point, if you look, each dot is a person, at the relationship between hemoglobin A1c and average blood sugar. It's quite linear. There is some variance. But this is as good a regression as you get in medicine. And if you want the slides, they come with notes, even things like the regression equation relating average glucose to hemoglobin A1c can be calculated as AG equals 28.7 times hemoglobin A1c in percent minus 46.7. Now, if you ask me this after the talk, I won't remember that because I just read it off the notes. But 
that's how precise you can get and how predictive, valuable, useful the hemoglobin A1C is in regard to things like your average blood sugar. Now here's the same data. This relates to hemoglobin A1C and blood sugar, but it does it in a colorful way. And guess what? Green is what you want, yellow is caution, and red is nicht gut. For patients, we make it even a little bit clearer. This is where you want to be. That is not where you want to be. This is the chance of living. That's the chance of living. We try to get it down to one visual per predictive biomarker. I want you to have the background, but this is the one that Jayashree, or when I do it, when I do it, or my staff under her does it, this is the one we show people. And we make sure they understand this and that. If they want to get into numbers, what their numbers are, fine. But we want them to see this and that. We want them to see this and that. And that's all we really care about them seeing. And if they have any questions, we'll try and answer them. But I think this is very clear because many people have either a blood sugar value or a hemoglobin A1C. Now, for the technical people out there, this actually is in standard international units, millimoles per liter, not milligrams per deciliter. I, I, I'm an old doctor. I remember milligrams per deciliter, but now SI units, standard international units. My boss, Don Young, is the guy who brought standard international units to the world. I'm supposed to advocate for them. So blood glucose is in SI units. Hemoglobin A1C is in percent, of course. So here we have the relationship between the three on one slide. Average glucose, hemoglobin A1C, and chance of living 10 years. And since technology is our friend, I'm saying that if you have a high hemoglobin A1C, you have a chance of dying that's high. And notice, I can stop this at any point if I want, if I have the dexterity. And this says that if my hemoglobin A1C was seven and a half, I would have an 83% chance of living. Well, actually it's a little worse than that, but okay. And, and here's the most important takeaway. If my hemoglobin A1C is less than five, my chance of living 10 years is 99%, even if I'm 80. And if there were enough centenarians to measure, I predict that their probability would be the same. If you keep these markers at their healthiest level, if you get enough of the good stuff in and keep the bad stuff down, you renew yourself. You renew yourself. Now, what if? What if the blood sugar is high and the hemoglobin A1C is okay? I already told you about white coat hyperglycemia. It's real. If anything I say doesn't track when you think about it later, email, go on our website. I'm happy to interact. I have wonderful people who will generally point you to frequently ask questions because we've heard the questions. We've been at this a long time. So we want a hemoglobin A1C that's more than uh, that's less than five percent. If it is more than five percent, you want a life habit solution. And what I mean by that is an immunotolerant diet. Eat foods that you can digest, assimilate, and eliminate without immune burden. Then a forty component super multi because there's more toxins out there. You need more nutrients in your multi. And I, did I mention 40 grams of fiber? Did I mention 40 billion probiotic bonds? And now if you need to regulate blood sugar naturally, I recommend all of the following. Standardized corosolic acid, mycelized forms of chromium citrate and picolinate 250 micrograms, Vanadium as a score bait, 250 micrograms. French lilac, 150 milligrams. Bitter melon or mara, mentioned in the Bible, 150 milligrams. If you go to some Chinese restaurants in the winter, they'll offer you bitter melon soup. Not because it doesn't taste good, it actually tastes quite good. But it's a tonic for your immune system in the winter. Huang Ti said that 3,500 years ago in a conversation with Sipo. 
We don't know what they really said, but we think they did. Huckleberry or bilberry, 100 milligrams. Agnes Castus, good old Agnes Castus. Aunt Agnes, as she's known in the herbal world. Soothes your pituitary. If your pituitary master gland is happier, the rest of you is happier. 250 milligrams. Phosphatidylcholine. I think we can now acknowledge that mycelization is a good thing. It enhances uptake. That phosphatides and lecithin, like phosphatidylcholine, are good for us and help get good things in. So we've been using them for uh, 30 years to mycelize our soft gels and to facilitate uptake because we produce food-like products because we respect nature. All of this is available in one mycelized soft gel. Everything I told you is available in one mycelized soft gel. And how much would you give? Well, you would dose it based on the hemoglobin A1C or the blood sugar. Now, I'm an advocate for hemoglobin A1C, and 10 years from now, I'm sure that's what we're going to be measuring, and today, most doctors still measure blood sugar. So if the blood sugar is elevated, you can give these dosings based on the blood sugar, or you can dose based on the hemoglobin A1C. The good news is that the blood sugar will respond within a month. The hemoglobin A1C will respond in three to four months. Why? Because it's hemoglobin, and the average lifespan of red cells is three to four months. But if you want to be a really scientific physician, you can measure fructosamine, fructosamine, a protein that has a half-life of one month. And if you use this formula and you measure hemoglobin A1C, then you should come back in three to four months, or measure fructosamine, and now you can come back every month and adjust the dosing. So the short half-life proteins give you shorter time measures of hemoglobin A1C. The longer lived proteins, like hemoglobin, give you seasonal uh, uh, change. Okay? With regard to type 1 diabetics, it, type 1 diabetes is also an autoimmune disease. Brittle type 1 diabetics always have anti-insulin antibodies as well as antibodies against their acinar insulin-producing cells. If you stimulate repair the way I'm suggesting, if you stimulate immune tolerance the way I'm suggesting, the need for insulin in the type 1 diabetic goes down. We did an outcome study in type 1 diabetes. We showed a full milligram per deciliter reduction in hemoglobin A1C in just six months a substantial reduction in insulin, improvement in quality of life, and they wanted to continue after the six months. They didn't want to go back. Now, these were people who were all on best standard of care before the study, and the control group continued on best standard of care according to the American Diabetes Association. So with that, we could reduce in just six months the hemoglobin A1C by a full milligram per deciliter, adding a decade of quality of life to those type 1 diabetics. It's okay to ask questions. If it's okay, we'll go on to the second predictive biomarker, and that is the high-sensitivity C-reactive protein, HSCRP. This is Ridker's marker, and he's made a career out of initially thinking it was specific for heart, but now really seeing it as a systemic or global measure of inflammation, and our contribution is to rethink this from a causal level it's really, really repair deficit. Now here you see the Framingham data on one axis. Sorry, here's the calculated Framingham 10-year data on this axis, the CRP on the y-axis, and you have uh, HSCRP uh, here, and then the modified Framingham CRP risk on the y-axis. So here you have X, Y, Z, three axes. What you want to see is that this is small and that's big. I didn't explain it very well, but this is big and that's small. Can you see that? All right. You want to be in this quartile, quintile, in this group population. Here's where you want to be. Less than five in your calculated Framingham risk and less than 0.5 in your HSCRP. In contrast, if you have a high Framingham risk and a high CRP, boy, are you in trouble. Okay? That's all. 
Now, this is inflammation. I can say it in Latin or English. This is a colorized radiograph showing an inflamed, in this case, wrist. Inflammation and pathology. I am a W board certified pathologist. Inflammation and pathology is really repair deficit in physiology. I think we should practice physiologic medicine, not pathologic medicine. I think we should practice medicine that evokes healing responses, not red and blue and dead medicine. Do you know what red and blue and dead is? When a pathologist looks at a slide, it's stained with hematoxylin and eosin, blue and red. It's dead. We looked under a microscope. The reason I became a clinical pathologist was I at least wanted specimens from live people. I didn't want red, blue, and dead. Healthy body repairs with very low HSCRP. CRP is a cry for help. When your CRP goes up, you have a repair problem. This is the molecule that recruits repair cells to the place of need. So HSCRP is a very interesting molecule. And if you look at the Framingham risk estimate against cardiovascular events, you find that the higher the CRP, the worse the outcomes. The lower the CRP, the better the outcomes. And yes, there is nuance, and the epidemiologists have been arguing about this for a long time. But this is New England Journal of Medicine 10 years ago showing that support for high sensitivity CRP as a predictive biomarker exists. And this was, uh, you know, a decade or more ago when they thought it was more specific for cardiovascular events. It is, but it's also a marker of overall general inflammation. So if it's in your joints or in your blood vessels, if it's in your skin or in your brain, any inflammatory repair deficit will raise the high sensitivity CRP. And just as we saw before, we can look at the calculated Framingham 10-year risk against the high sensitivity CRP and the probability of living 10 years, and it's a linear relationship. Now, some of this is mathematically corrected to make it linear, but it's a linear relationship because it's easier for us to see. And here, as we saw before, the little animation, the higher the CRP, the worser, the lower the CRP, the better. And if my CRP is 5, I have, I'm going to live, but not as well as if my HSCRP was less than 0.5. So we know that we want the hemoglobin A1C to be less than 5%, and we want the high sensitivity CRP to be less than 0.5, and that's milligrams uh, per liter. So high sensitivity CRP is a pro-repair antioxidant that responds to nutrients. What would I do if the HSCRP is elevated? I would do a personal C cleanse to find out how much ascorbate, not to be confused with vitamin C, how much ascorbate, how much buffered mineral ascorbate, 100% L-ascorbate uh, is needed. I would increase polyphenolics in the diet and supplements. I would increase B vitamins as methyl cofactors for balanced natural forms. We always and only use natural forms of nutrients. We use all eight forms of folate. We don't use synthetic folic acid. Biodetox with ascorbates and chlorophylls and things like that, like vegetable juices and broths. High sulfur foods, G-G-O-B-E, ginger, garlic, onions, brassica sprouts and eggs, G-G-O-B-E. I think if you wake me up in the middle of the night, I can say G-G-O-B-E, garlic, ginger, onions, brassica sprouts and eggs. These should be staples in the diet, not condiments. Staples in the diet, not condiments. And then acetylenes and EPA, DHA, you want omega-3s to be rich, you want pure, uncontaminated, mycelized fats, mycelized fish oils, if you use them. I recommend all six of these. So if, the, if there's repair needed, I want to know how much ascorbate the body needs. And the polyphenolics are the synergists that Albert Sims Georgie showed worked beneficially with the ascorbates. This was in the 1930s. I want plenty methylation factors, all B-complex factors, including PABA and pantothene, uh, including choline and inositol, which were originally vitamers, but they, there's a national choline deficiency going on. Uh, we want to be able to detox using vegetable juices and broths, but also supplements. We want high sulfur foods. You can actually be fooled into having a low homocysteine because you don't have enough sulfur in your diet. We'll get to that. And you want EPA, DHA, and other food-based nutrients 
So this is a lifestyle-based program. It is about what you eat and drink, think and do. We'll get to the thinking and doing uh, in due course. So these are the responses that we suggest if the CRP is above 0.5. Ascorbates based on individual determination, that's the C-Cleanse. And cclen.4hsc.org is a website that will have the PDF. Please do pull it down and look at it. There are some details. In vivo, always a protective antioxidant. I know that intravenous vitamin C at times can inside certain lysosomes and certain cancer cells be a prooxidant, but clinically ascorbate has a very long relaxation time, which means it's never a harmful prooxidant. Physiologically, it's always a beneficial antioxidant. We want 100% L-ascorbate always. We want fully buffered and reduced ascorbate always. So it's 100% L-ascorbate, fully reduced and buffered always. We want to recycle. We want to use these because the ascorbate recycles to coferols and lipoate. If you want the ALA to go up, all eight forms of ALA, you want to use ascorbate. If you want vitamin Z to be happy and regenerated, you want enough ascorbate. Glutathione, GSH is the abbreviation for glutathione. If you want enough glutathione, the best way to raise glutathione physiologically is have enough ascorbate. Alton Meister showed that years ago. If you want to raise taurine, NAD, FAD, DNA, if you want to protect the DNA from extra oxidative damage, ascorbate goes right into the nucleus and helps protect, so do the polyphenols. And then polyunsaturated fatty acids. We want enough omega-3. In general, the supplements should have omega-3, and they can maybe skip the omega-6, although people on a very low-fat diet can be deficient in both, and then you should have a supplement that has both omega-3 and 6. Or what we often do is keep them on the fish oils, and I'll tell you why the fish oils and not the algae in a minute. Keep them on the fish oils and add an omega-369 CLA DHA uh, essential fat supplement if they're on a low-fat diet. If they're Canadian or live in North America and eating a more typical diet, they get too much omega-6. So you don't need to supplement omega-6. In fact, healthy omega-3 to omega-6 is 4 to 1. If you look at the NHANES data, the National Health and Nutrition Survey in the United States, the last NHANES data suggests 50 to 100 times more omega-6 than omega-3 in the diet of many Americans. It's really easy to do that today. Not good, not recommended. Uh, it fills doctor's offices. That was supposed to be a joke. Anyway, just checking. It sets the cell redox. Ascorbate sets the cell redox. It does a lot of good things for you. It prevents a lot of excess oxidation. If you want to convert ferric iron to ferrous iron, the physiologic way is with reducing substances like ascorbate. If you want to quench oxidative damage and trap free radicals, ascorbate is Mother Nature's answer. Do we have more oxidative challenge than we used to? By acclamation, right? It's no longer a discussion. I remember when we were debating that. We're not debating that anymore. That's a given. Well, to do about it, we're still debating. This is one of the things to do. The C-Cleanse, fine, by the way, it is also called the C-Flush, but more people will do the C-Cleanse than will do the C-Flush. So call it a C-Cleanse. People are into cleansing today. I, as I told you, I have people who actually tell me, use this word, not that word. Okay, I can learn. Ascorbate donates electrons. This is a good thing. It increases uh, the salvage of cytochrome C. If you have enough ascorbate and your mitochondrial battery is short-circuited, ascorbate is the unique physiologic molecule with half a millivolt capacity to bridge the gap and restore the battery, the mitochondria, to health. So if you really want to be good to your cells and your cell energetic system, you want to use the C-Cleanse because only when you get near the amount your body needs, the C-saturation, uh, uh, do you really get this beneficial effect on the mitochondria? So, inflammation is in vogue. It's in relation to autoimmune diseases and arthritis as an autoimmune disease. It's related to diabetes, another autoimmune disease. 
and also to cardiovascular diseases and cancer is inflammatory in part and so is pulmonary disease and so is neurologic disease and by the way that includes Alzheimer's and prion diseases how many of you are terrified of prion diseases you should be you should be very very worried about prion diseases and they come in good prions and bad prions and you want the good ones but not the bad ones how do you get good ones nobody knows how do you get bad ones? We're not sure, but we know they're bad. Really? I was talking with Giuseppe Lignami, who was a protege of Stan Prusner, who got the Nobel Prize for prions. The difference in prions is shape. They change shape from good to bad. They're shape shifters. Shape shifters? Isn't that science fiction? No, science fact. They're shape shifters. Well, what causes the shift? They don't know. I suggest a high redox in an acid environment will shift to a bad prion and a low healthy redox with lots of buffering minerals and correction of metabolic acidosis will shift them back to healthy forms and shapes. We're investigating that. Ask me back in a few years, hopefully we'll have some data on that. But it's also interesting that Giuseppe and a gal who brought this information to him have found that if you pass prion rich material say at a slaughterhouse because you know those animals that sometimes we eat they have to be worried about prions too if you pass prion rich fluid through biodynamic compost only biodynamic does it if you pass prion rich fluids through biodynamic compost the bad prions get absorbed to the humic compounds that are present in biodynamic compost, but not organic or commercial compost. Another talk for another time. Third biomarker is homocysteine. We've got to get through all of these. Here you see the data as it's usually published from the classic Nygaard study. They looked at and published less than nine micromoles up to more than 20. You were better here and worse there. We redid their data looking again and found that less than six was even better. So your goal value for homocysteine is less than six. This is micromoles per liter. The higher you go, the worse you are in terms of proportion surviving. And this was six year data. So in six years, if you have a homocysteine over 20, have any of you seen patients with high homocysteines? Measure it, you'll find a lot of people with high homocysteine. If your homocysteine is more than 20 in six years, you have a 25% um, or 30% chance or 35% chance actually of dying in just six years. So we think this is the third one that is ready for prime time. I would, however, point out that oxidative stress is complicated. This has to do with methylation, sulfur cycles, has to do with methionine and homocysteine. You want methionine to be relatively high and homocysteine low. This particular chart from Marcel Nimney, who was one of my mentors back when I was a student, but who's still going strong in his 80s, this is about sulfur metabolism. You can even see why some of the autistic children have low homocysteines but high cystothionines and uh, lose glutathione. Uh, it's really all on this uh, figure. You won't be able to get it uh, you know, in the few minutes I'm showing it, but please go back and look at this. Any of you who want, I have a... Uh, uh, a microchip uh, that has the uh, bat background information on it for you. So you're welcome to ask for that after the talk if you want. Um, here are two different studies showing that the lower your homocysteine, the least or lowest risk, and the higher the homocysteine, the higher risk. This is five-year mortality. Here's senility risk. It's related to homocysteine. The higher the homocysteine, the higher risk of senility. And I predict, based on talks we had earlier today, that the people with the high homocysteines will also be the people with more mercury and other toxicants, including persisting pollutants, hormone disruptors, volatile organic chemicals, maybe even radioisotopes. So again, you can get it down to a simple figure that looks at cardiovascular disease against homocysteine level and in relation to survival for 10 years, same animation, and we show that high is bad, and getting better gets better. Now, how long does it take to go through this? And I don't mean on this slide, because it takes about two and a half seconds to go through on the slide. How long does it take to change any of these biomarkers in medical practice or dental practice? Weeks. Weeks. 
Your microbiome and metabolism change within days to weeks of making a lifestyle change. You can regain decades of quality life in a matter of months. You can regain decades of quality life in a matter of months. Now, there's always a what if. If you don't take sulfur foods, the GGOBE sulfur foods, if you don't take those in your diet, then all the sulfur compounds might be low. And now you'll have a low homocysteine, but not because it's good. But that's because the methionine is low also. So when we get a low homocysteine, for one month we explain to people that one or more of garlic, ginger, onions, brassica, sprouts, and eggs should be staples in their diet for a month. And they say, oh, I eat garlic. We said, no, no, we mean whole bulbs of roasted garlic. We mean enough ginger that your taste buds will stand up and do push-ups. <laughs> Make them staples, not condiments in the diet. Follow Thomas Jefferson, he said, make these staples not, uh, make, these, make these into staples of your diet. He actually said, let meat be a condiment and let garlic and things like that be staples of your diet. Now, did I mention GGOBE? Yes, if you roast garlic, you won't smell like the garlic because you polymerize some of the allopropyl sulfides, but they still benefit the body. So what we do is we have a garlic roaster. And you either take the whole bulb and cut off the bottom and put it in the roaster at 375 for about 20, 25 minutes, and it comes out like custard. But this is for those of you who like to play with your food. Because when you're done, the garlic is still in the bulb, and you have to squeeze it out. Now, now don't touch it when it comes right out of the oven, because it's oily and concentrates the heat. But as it gets, and don't let it, cool off totally because then it'll get hard. But when it's warm, it tastes like custard. And if you like to play with your food, you can squeeze the roast garlic out. Or, or you can go to any oriental market where somebody has already cleaned the garlic for you. And now you just pour the garlic pearls into uh, the roaster, same conditions, and now you have soft, not very sharp tasting, but detoxifying roast garlic. It turns out that almost all of these foods are more easily digested if they're warmed or cooked. So raw food is an option for people with very healthy digestion, but if you don't have healthy digestion, work your way towards raw. Don't make a political decision to be become a raw food advocate. So GGOBE we recommend. We also recommend recycled glutamine. We recycle it with PAC. That's pyridoxal alpha ketoglutarate. It's a single molecule. You want to use the real PAC, not the two separate B6 and uh, ketoglutarate, because that doesn't work. It turns out most of the workalikes in the supplement field don't work. And when I hear workalike, my antennas go up. So I want to know that the forms of nutrients in supplements are the same as those shown beneficial in outcome studies. And in the ones that I'm involved with, that's a rule. That's not, we don't do that when it's easy. We don't do that when we can. Many companies will tell you, we do that when we can. Well, when can't you? I want to know when you can't, because I don't want that. Okay. So recycle your glutamine. Glutamine is an energy source for your gut. If you want a happy microbiome, you want enough glutamine. But if you give 15 to 60 grams of glutamine, as Doug Wilmot recommends, you can build up glutamate. And glutamate is a excitoneurotoxin. Ooh. So we want to stay within physiology. That's why we figured out how to recycle the glutamine. So we recycle the glutamine tenfold with the pack. We give a gram and a half of glutamine and get 15 grams worth of benefit. But never any glutamate buildup. Because we respect physiology. I don't practice pharmacology with natural products. I use enough natural products to balance out the toxin needs that the individual has. Too little is too little. Too much is too much. Just right is where we want to be. Lifely colors, the carotenoids and B-complex. We want mixed natural carotenoids, all of them. Alpha and beta carotene, astaxanthin, zeaxanthin, cryptoxanthin, lutein, lycopene. Right now, astaxanthin is in. I want all of them. 
Why? Because nature makes all of them. And they go to different places in the body. And I want to combine this with comprehensive liver detox, a silicon beta rich silymarin, carnitine in the fumarate form, and mycelized CoQ10 and put all of that in one soft drink. You can do that. And when people say to you, oh, beta carotene was tested, it didn't work. Yes, we dusted some Finnish 20 to 40 pack year smokers with a little, a little folic acid, 4 to 800 micrograms, a little vitamin E, but the wrong form, and it didn't help them. I wouldn't have done that study. I would have saved the money. They could have given me the money, and I would have told them before the study what they would find. And I don't mean the scientists who did that study who did it as a self-fulfilling prophecy. They were trying to make nutraceuticals into magic bullets. Mm -hmm. No. You want, why do you want all the carotenoids? Because we respect nature. I can be more technical. I don't have enough time. Be complex, batch, ba balanced forms. B1, B2, B3, B6, B12, and the hydroxylcobalamin form. Methylcobalamin can reduce metallic mercury to methyl mercury. As we heard this morning, don't do that. Hydroxylcobalamin is the preferred physiologic form of B12. Locally, the body converts this to methylcobalamin as needed with a half-life of seconds. So hydroxylcobalamin is the B12 form. Well, no, no, I can tell you on advice of counsel, don't say B4 or B7, even though B7 is folate, but what I can say to you is B1, B2, B3, B6, B12, folates, PABA, biotin, pantothene, inositol, and choline. Originally, inositol and choline were vitamins. They were, they were in the B family. I want to make sure you've got enough of all of those, because if any one of those is deficient, it will control your whole metabolism. Not too much, not too little, just right. And here's the clinical takeaway. How many of you have sunshine yellow urine? Good for you. More than the average? Talk to your friends. Glass clear is deficient. If only because you want to protect your kidney and your bladder from the toxins that get concentrated and excreted through there. So you want your urine to be sunshine yellow, indicating enough B complex. Not muddy brown, not dehydrated. Sunshine yellow, well hydrated. Okay. Fourth biomarker, lymphocyte response assay by ELISA ACT. This is a test that I developed. It measures functional bad antibodies, but not neutralizing good ones. It measures immune complexes and T cell responses all at the same time. You've heard me talk about it before. I'm going to be very brief. You want to eat foods you can digest, assimilate, and eliminate without immune burden. The functional measure of T cells and B cells is the lymphocyte response assay. You can do it by ELISA ACT, you can do it by MELISA, you can do it by colony formation, but antibodies are out of vogue and passe because IgG antibody tests measure good and bad and don't distinguish function. You need to know only the bad ones, not the good ones. Neutralizing beneficial antibodies, IgG beneficial antibodies are good, not bad. Fifth biomarker, that acidosis risk, first morning you're in pH, Metabolic acidosis underlies all chronic disease, according to Harrison's textbook of medicine. First morning urine pH is a measure of mineral status. And the enzyme catalysts that make your cell work, that make life possible, are all dependent on different minerals. So you want them, you want a protein efficiency that is greater than 90%. Your cell has a quality control mechanism, and the protein synthesis can be either more than 90% or less than 10%, depending on whether the cell is buffered, what its oxidative state is, and what its redox state is. Just those three measures. And these predictive biomarkers get at those specific measures. Magnesium is an essential electrolyte. It is the forgotten electrolyte, but it is essential. It's hard to get in and easy run out. That's why we couple the magnesium with choline citrate. So we get the magnesium in and chaperone it into the cell and correct the choline deficiency all at the same time. Then we energize and alkalinize the cell with the citrate. Such a deal. This is Seagard Anderson's classic uh, nomogram. The, the thing I want you to see is the small healthy area and the large area of metabolic acidosis. You can study this later. Time is marching on. I'm going to march on. 
Urine after rest should be between six and a half and seven and a half. Acid wears you out. Healthy repair zone is green. The cata catabolic illness, too alkaline, is bad. So you want to be in the middle, the path of moderation. Have a pH of six and a half to seven and a half in the morning. If it's much above seven and a half on a consistent basis, you're losing ammonia and you're cannibalizing lean muscle. If it's below six and a half, you have net acid excess and mineral deficiency. Correct the mineral deficiency, the acidosis will go away. But people can be hundreds of milliequivalents deficient. They can have hundreds of milliequivalents excess acid, which means you may have to give them an alkaline, mineral rich diet for months and months before the pH comes back into the six and a half to seven and a half range. Perseverance furthers. Perseverance furthers. In the I Ching, the Chinese book of medicine called the I Ching, in 63 out of 64 uh, assemblies, it says perseverance furthers. Perseverance furthers. Now, the alkaline way is what we recommend. This is to get magnesium in using choline citrate and correct the acidosis. Metabolic acidosis is bad. Catabolic illness is bad. In the middle is good. Some friends have suggested that I flip this side so that this is up and that is down. But this is bad and that is bad and this is good. Okay? That was Jackie Mason. All right. My mother was a, was a performer. I have to do a little of that. In honor and memory of her. So magnesium, the, the forgotten mineral is important. Uh, there is a periodic table where magnesium sits in an important place. I like magnesium in the glycinate, citrate, ascorbate mixed forms. Any one of those is good. Different places in the GI tract like to take up magnesium differentially, so I recommend a combination of magnesium glycinate, citrate, and ascorbate. You take it with choline citrate as a chaser. You can now dose 440 to 880 milligrams of elemental magnesium a day. And many people will tell you that over 440 of elemental magnesium causes the runs. It causes the runs if people can't take it up. You give it along with the choline citrate so that the block in the calcium magnesium ATPase is overcome. Now they can get the magnesium in. So we want magnesium to displace toxic minerals. When your body is deficient in magnesium, it will take up toxic metals because it's hungry for divalent cations. When it has enough magnesium and buffering minerals, the calcium magnesium ATPase is very selective, and if you're exposed, you will get less toxic metals into the body. And the gut metallothionine, if you have enough sulfur in your diet and energy to make metallothionine, metallothionine will trap the toxic metals in the gut, will trap the toxic metals in the plasma will trap the toxic metals in your brain. There are metallothionines throughout the body as long as you have enough sulfur in your diet. The nation, both the Canadian and American nations, and with NAFTA we now include Mexico, we're all deficient in sulfur. If you walk down the street giving out garlic, ginger, ginger onions, brassica sprouts, and eggs to people, you would lower the cost of care and improve the quality of life. You don't have to take all five. Pick the one you like. If one of those is a comfort food, mazel tov. If, if, if you don't like one of those, don't eat what you don't like and don't eat what you react against, but eat the ones you can. And if you can't eat any of them, come to me. I'll put you on methionine or something else. It will get the sulfur into you somehow. But most of the time, people can eat one or more of those. And as you can tell, I'm a Beatrice Trump Hunter fan. I think nutrition begins in the pot, in the cooking pot, not the stuff you smoke, in the cooking pot. <laughs> Some of you are from Colorado, I have to be clear. <laughs> Vitamin D. This is another one where if you walk down the street giving out D3, I know that my colleague says D2 is okay, but I think the native D3 is the cholecalciferol is the form to use. And you know the test to do. It's the 25-hydroxy-D, not the 125. It's technical, but the answer is 25-hydroxy-D is the reliable measure of status. We get this from fish. Fish oils, especially deep water fish. We can get this from other sources, including algae, but the algae are only DHA. You want EPA and DHA, you want both. You want EPA for body and DHA for brain, but you want DHA for brain and EPA for body, and you actually want both for both, although DHA is one-third of the white matter of your brain. And when I see radiologists who say the white matter is deficient in that brain, I say to them, is the DHA deficient? 
And you know what they say? How do you spell that? So deficiency in vitamin D increases HSCRP. It also increases IL-10, interleukin-10. Who knew? And insulin resistance. So why give vitamin D to everybody? Because a little bit is surely safe. Too much is too much. We'll get to too much. We'll talk about a nutritionist who gave, took, took too much. But insulin resistance is clearly something we want to resist, right? So correct the vitamin D. And what's the level that you want? You want 50 to 80 nanograms per ml. You want the 25 hydroxy D to be 50 to 80. And if that means 10,000 IU of vitamin D, which is what it takes me to get into that 50 to 80 range a day, that's what you take. And if you need more to get into that range, take more. And if you need less to get into that range, take less. Take the amount you need to get to 50 to 80. Big difference in all-cause morbidity, mortality, cancer, risk, cardiovascular disease, and pain, but also autoimmune disease and inflammatory conditions. But did I leave anything out? Well, being nice to your parents. The seventh is the high-sensitivity omega-3 index, omega-3 to 6 ratio. Here a quick story. I am almost done. A quick story. I'm in Patty Doyster's office at the military medical school, and she's working with the fellow who developed this test, very nice scientist, fatty acid scientist, and he says there's so few people today who have a healthy omega-3 level, and I happen to be in her office just sitting there because I have nothing else to do. I was just sitting there. Um, and she points to me, and she says, Russ does. And he immediately takes out a lancet, and before I knew anything, he had my finger, he took a spot of blood, and he put it on a piece of filter paper, and a few days later, he called me up. He said, you're our poster child. I said, what does that mean? He says, your omega-3 index is 15%. That's what we want. Over 8 is good. Most people are 2. Okay? So if you walked around giving EPA, DHA randomly, you would improve the quality of life and lower the cost of care. The last one I mentioned was the DNA oxidative risk marker. I think this is important. Both the omega-3 to 6 ratio and the 8-oxoguanine, this is a urine test to measure that aspect of oxidative risk or antioxidant need. And what I give is EPA, DHA, three to six grams a day. And I will go above six grams a day if they're under more oxidative stress. But three to six grams a day in the literature is certainly a, a, a functional uh, a, and, and safer. Uh, up to nine and 10 grams a day. I'm currently taking nine grams a day uh, because I have a tendency towards higher blood pressure and it helps me. CoQ10 somewhere between 300 and 1,200 milligrams a day with tocopherols mycelized in rice bran oil. So you get three times the uptake of the CoQ10. And I do 300 to 1,200 milligrams a day for a month, and then I back off. So I load them up for a month, and then I back off. You can build up slowly. That's okay. That's what most people do. I prefer to load them for a month and then back off. Liver detox, I had mentioned this before. You want a sylvan data rich. L-carnitine, lycopene, carotenoid complex, mycelized in a soft gel. The ascorbate, this is a population. The yellow on the far left are the few people who are really healthy and their C cleanse with less than four grams. Then there's a group that cleanse between five and 10 grams. That's the blue spike. And 80% of the population, the green hump, is between 10 and 120 grams to do the C cleanse sometimes more. The reigning champ for anyone who's interested is 360 grams a day. This was a nurse with psoriatic arthritis for 30 years, and the first time she was pain-free was after the C cleanse. So it's surprising how much oxidative stress people are under today, but guess what? We did it to each other. We're all in it together. And ascorbate will tell you how much oxidative stress you have at that point in time. We recommend the cleanse and follow the online guidance. We want to use the polyphenolics, the flavonoids and flavanols, because they're synergistic and helpful, and specifically quercetin, dihydrate, and soluble OPC, the safer and more effective flavonoids and flavanols. Not all quercetins are created equal. There are thousands of them. Quercetin, dihydrate, and soluble OPC are safer. They're the only ones that are not mutagenic in the Ames assay, and Bruce Ames and I are colleagues I'm old enough that I'm a colleague with a lot of people, but he is going, he's bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, going strong in his mid-80s uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Oakland area now. 
So to put it all together in a summary, you want LRA tests and you want an immune system that's tolerant. You want a first morning urine pH at six and a half to seven and a half. So that we can deal with these reactive oxygen species, etc. You want a hemoglobin A1C of less than 5% to keep your blood sugar insulin energy intact. You want a homocysteine that's less than six to keep your blood pressure down and your detoxification up. You want reactive oxygen species and ozone to be in the right place at the right time, but not in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, if you're concerned about PCOS or NAFLD, I remember when there wasn't much non-alcoholic liver disease. Now there's a lot of it. It's caused by fructose. NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Oh, they pay more for that. Acanthosis nigrans. If you speak in Latin, they, spend, they pay even more. HSCRP of less than 0.5 so that you have effective insulin uh, glucose regulation. You want to have endothelial function. You don't want to have endothelial dysfunction. You want your NO to be uh, able and enabled. You want oxidized HDL, LDL, and oxoguanine to be as close to zero as possible. You want abdominal fat to be healthy and not full of schmutz and oxidized stuff. You want your omega-3, omega-quant to be favorable towards omega-3 so you don't have sticky platelets. How many of you want sticky platelets? Nah, you don't want sticky platelets. I'm an old coagulationist. You don't want sticky platelets. Turns out magnesium is an antioxidant that protects fatty acids in the lipoprotein carriers. Who knew this? Ron Elin. He's the guy who did that work. Okay, so we had talked about this. It is the summary. Sometimes I go through the summary twice, but I don't have time. So we have eight predictive biomarkers. Hemoglobin A1C, HSCRP, homocysteine, LRA by ELISA Act, first AM urine pH, vitamin D, HS omega-3 index, and 8-oxoguanine. These eight tests are the tests of tomorrow available today with lifestyle plans and interpreted to goal values. I recommend these as the next big thing. I'd already showed you this inflammation slide, so I'm not going to repeat it. Whose shoulders do we stand upon? This is... Uh, Mechnikov and Cushing. Oh, this is Eli Mechnikov, sorry. He was in favor of yogurt in the late 19th century. Uh, here's Cushing again. Uh, anyone know who this is? Rene Dubose, think globally, act locally. Anybody know who this is? Jimmy Watson. Now, why did he do the genome project and not the epigenome project? He said you had to have something that even politicians could understand. And the mechanistic misunderstanding of the genome was something they could understand. Epigenetics was too complicated. All right. Anyway, so I suggest that the next big thing is evidence-based predictive biomarkers for better outcome results. Here is, in, and in your handout, uh, is a resource to access them. Uh, uh, you can access these directly as professionals through professional labs. You can also have consumers access these through Better Lab Test Now, an, a, a portal that provides interpretation to the consumer of what to do with the lab results. So if you want to practice dentistry, but you want your patients to be healthier, you can send them to better lab tests now. If you want to practice comprehensive biological dentistry, getting the bad stuff out and the good stuff in, talk to me. This is me, a little less of me, with all that stuff. This is an email if you need it. And I really want to thank all of you for your attention, your interest.